as we've already gone over, Moses has recorded for us this unsavory family history. It's uh, the Messiah's family history. This is the history of Jesus's uh, family where Judah, the shepherd, he anticipates many of the failures of David, the shepherd. They both have rebellious sons. They both have daughters or daughter-in-law who have been abused. They both fail to rectify this. They both have similarly fractally related events that happen during sheep shearing. Tamar deceives Judah. Abigail saves Nabal. Absalom kills Amnon. All of these things happening during sheep shearing. Judah's fall is echoed by Samson at Timnah. Both of them giving away their strength and authority to women at Timnah. Judah's seduced by a woman who takes his authority. Samson is seduced by a woman who takes his authority. Judah and Judah's house is being taken by Canaan. He's not taking Canaan, but he's being taken by Canaan. Uh, Jacob's family is not ready to take, they're not ready to receive their inheritance. They're not ready for it yet. They need to learn suffering and obedience like Joseph. So they'll follow Joseph down to Egypt, and then they'll come out and they'll take Canaan. But right now, Canaan is taking them. There's the same brother murder that we've seen. Onan spilling his seed is a form of brother murder. He didn't want to build up his father's house, or his brother's house, rather. And this is similar to Judah. Judah himself, his betrayal of Joseph, throwing Joseph in the pit, form of brother murder. There's unlawful unions, unlawful friendships happening with Judah, with these Canaanites. And as we know, brother murder, unlawful union, then comes judgment. But we have this turn of events. We have wickedness flourishing in Judah's house. Judah's giving away his authority, literally giving his staff and his signet and his cord away to a woman. But then Judah repents. Judah is deceived by a woman. It's this reversal of the fall, eliciting repentance. And that judgment is staved off. And we have this rekindling of hope that the covenant will perpetuate with Perez and Zerah. The holy harlot Tamar, like Rahab, she deceives the serpent and saves Judah's house by eliciting repentance from him. And that's the reason this passage is here. It shows Judah as the older brother who repents. We, we start to see the older brother being redeemed. We saw it with Esau. We saw it with Esau a little bit, but we're starting to see it even more here with Judah. Joseph is the obedient brother, brother. Judah is the repentant brother. And today we're going to look a little bit more closely at the moments leading up to uh, his repentance, where I would submit to you Judah in his person is a proto-Pharisee. He has embodied the sins of the Pharisees that Jesus is constantly calling out. And what is that? What is the sin of the Pharisees? What's a major sin? Hypocrisy. He calls them hypocrites. And what does that mean? It comes from a Greek word which means masks. It, actors would wear these masks. They pretend to be somebody that they're not. Jesus says inside they're dead. They're, they're, they're skeletons and worms and spider webs inside. But outside they pretend to be righteous. I'm holy. I go to church on Sunday. Look at me. And then during the week they were being, they were being wicked. They were sinning against God. They were sinning against their parents. They were sinning against other people. They hated other people. They hated Gentiles. They didn't want other people coming into their kingdom. It was theirs and not God's. And so they pretended to be righteous. They wanted the approval from others, but they forsook God's law and they made up their own laws. And we have the same thing now today with our own culture. Different cultures are going to create different kinds of Pharisaical sins. The Pharisaical sins of a culture which worships God is going to be a whole lot more nefarious because it's going to be acts of worship to God, but it's not really. That's what the Pharisees were doing. Our culture doesn't worship God, and so you have different forms of Pharisaism. You have people, you have socialist, liberals, uh, feminist. These people, they say, Dostoevsky talks about this. He says they love humanity, but they hate their neighbor. 
And that's exactly, they want to appear to love people, but inwardly they really hate people. This, our neighbor right here, she has, a, she has a bumper sticker that says, make America kind again. And then she has another bumper sticker which says, smile. I've never seen this woman smile in my life. I've never seen her make direct contact with me. Uh, the, this, this neighbor right here. And uh, that's kind of, in a, in, a, in a nutshell, this is what liberals are, are, are doing, or this is what unbelievers are doing. We have it with conservative Christians as well. Conservative Christians will do this kind of, particularly soft conservatives. They will say things because they want the world to accept them. Um, and so uh, Judah is doing this kind of thing. He is, he is uh, evidencing this in his own life. It's a concern for looking outwardly holy, but being inwardly sinful. Okay, Judah sends his friend, we're not told that it's Hurrah, but the Adulamite, his friend the Adulamite, which earlier in the passage it says it's Hurrah. He sends Hurrah to go give his pledge to Tamar, the, the harlot. He doesn't know it's Tamar. And he can't find her because she's not, because there was no harlot there. Now, uh, there's a couple of things that we can, we can take from this. Uh, Hera, this Adulamite, this Canaanite, is not a very good friend. What's he doing? He's aiding and abetting Judah's sinfulness, his secret life. He's brought into his secret life. He's covering up his sin. Right? Judah had secretly visited this prostitute, uh, this harlot. Uh, and if you, if, you, if you don't know what a harlot is, uh, for, some, for some of the children, think of like Cardi B or any, any of these women who sing provocatively. Those are harlots. Uh, they're they're, they're um, lewd and they ought to be avoided. And they, and they mock marriage by not actually marrying a husband and submitting to him. Okay, so he goes and he secretly visits a harlot and uh, he has Zira helping him out. He should, he should give the pledge because he said he was gonna give her the pledge, but the whole thing is sinful and Zara's helping him out. He's not saying you need to repent of this, or at least it's not recorded. He's not saying this is sinful what you've done. He's not confronting his brother in sin. He's facilitating his brother in sin. The other thing that we can take from this is that Judah, here's the first spot where Judah is concerned about how he looks. He's not gonna go himself. He sends somebody else to go. And he can't find her, so he stops looking for her. And what does he say? So that we won't be shamed, mm -hmm. right? So he's, a, he's, he's not concerned about his sin that, he did, that, he, that he's done. He's concerned that people are gonna laugh at him for giving away everything he owned to a prostitute. That's what he's concerned with, how people perceive him, not what he did. How people think he is, not who he actually is. And as Christians, we deal with who we actually are. We deal with the reality of the situation that we are sinful. And Judah is suffocating that, he's covering that. And it's good to want to avoid the shame of sin, but you do that by avoiding the sin, not by covering it up, not by covering it up that way. There's a way, there's an ungodly way to cover up sin in a godly way. Ungodly way is this way, by lying and, 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 and secretly engaging in it. But then there's a godly way where you confess it and it's covered by the blood of Christ, where you, where you are forgiven and we, you, that sin is covered, it's gone, it's eradicated. Okay. Um, furthermore, uh, this is, if we, if we this, this typology might not hold, but I, I offer it by way of suggestion. If Tamar is this harlot made holy or holy harlot theme that we see in scripture, we might say that it's a theme of the kingdom. That the, chur the church, I see some confused looks out here. The church is uh, compared to a woman. The church is a harlot who is made holy, okay? That holy harlot theme is embodied in Tamar and Rahab. And we see it all throughout scripture. Church, kingdom, also similarly synonymous, uh, not identical, but synonymous um, or similar. And what Judah does, similar to his first century descendants, is he stops seeking for the kingdom and he gives it up for the sake of appearances. 
I, uh, that may not hold, but uh, that's something uh, to consider if we're to kind of extend this typology even further. Okay, uh, stop looking for, I don't want to look bad. Stop seeking the kingdom, I don't want to look bad. That's definitely what the Pharisees did. Perhaps uh, there's something of that with Judah here. Okay, um, but even if the typology doesn't hold, Judah is directly uh, committing the same sins as the Pharisees of wanting to uh, lo look good, um, but being unfaithful. Okay. All right. Now, the sin of Pharisaism is extended even further when we see how Judah reacts to the news that Tamar has been um, practice harlotry and that she's pregnant by harlotry. Judah's response is bring her out and let her be burned. OK, it's it's high capital punishment, torturous capital punishment which he wants for her. He, he wants to burn the harlot while he himself was burning with lust for harlots. So the, it's this incredible hypocrisy happening here with, with Judah. And this, with, the fair, with pharisaical kind of denunciations, they tend to be superlative. They tend to be hyperbolic when people themselves are in sin. Of course, God is just and wrath comes. But when you see people attacking you for being godly, it's often because they themselves are engaged in some kind of sin. And so they're, they ratchet up the denunciations similar to uh, Judah. He's publicly indignant about uh, sins, but he himself privately is engaged in all kinds of sins. Yeah. He also had motive to kill her, too. Then he wouldn't have to give his son over to her. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Right, that could be a reason. That, that's a good. That's a good point. He he was reluctant to give Shayla to to her, and so this would be a reason to get rid of the Tamar problem, which he thought Tamar was killing his sons when when his sons were actually killing themselves. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good point. Okay. There's a couple of other things going on here. Judah is continuing the sin that his brothers did at Shechem. Right. Remember in Shechem. His brothers, they permitted idolatry to happen in their home. They themselves were sinful at that moment. And then they get indignant about Shechem fornicating with Dinah. And then what do they do? Because of this sexual immorality, they massacre the entire town and they pillage it. It's an incredible, it's disproportionate justice. And it's because they're sinful men. They don't know how to judge rightly. And so we have a similar thing happening here with Judah. Judah himself is, is engaged in sin, and it's this disproportionate justice that he's wanting to execute. Furthermore, it's a, it's a Shechem in miniature, because he not only wants to punish Tamar, but he knows that she's pregnant. He wants to kill the child as well. So he's willing to kill the, a child and Tamar in this uh, burning the harlot, uh, uh, this call to burn the harlot. Okay. <clears throat> Burning the harlot is seen one place in the law. And as we've been going through the, the patriarchs, we've seen that the law addresses many of the situations that we see here. The law says not to marry a sister, not to marry a rival sister. Uh, there's all kinds of things like this in the law which pertain to um, the patriarchs. And in Leviticus 21.9, we read this. The daughter of any priest, if she profanes herself by playing the harlot, she profanes her father, she shall be burned with fire. It's the only place I'm aware of where, some, where someone is burned with fire. A priest's daughter who plays the harlot, she profanes her father, which is an interesting kind of covenantal uh, consequence uh, there. And her punishment is to be burned with fire. Um, Tamar is not his physical daughter. She's his daughter-in-law. But uh, if this holds, if this does hold to daughter-in-laws, it doesn't say that, but let's say it does apply, or that this was written with this in mind, there's an inference that we can draw, and that is that Judah is a priest. This is before the Levitical priesthood is given. And when we look at the way that uh, worship was done, it was done by the, pa the patriarchs. Noah sets up an altar. 
Abraham sets up an altar. Uh, we see um, even the Passover was done by the heads of households. Um, there wasn't a priesthood at that time. And so we see that there's this priesthood kind of this kind of proto priesthood of, of all believers, but kind of embodied in the patriarchs. Judah is a priest here, but he's a wicked priest. Um, he's wanting to um, uh, burn uh, his harlot daughter who's not actually um, a harlot in the, in the sense that the law meant. Furthermore, in Leviticus, we have uh, in Leviticus 20, 12, we read this. If a man lies with his daughter in law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have committed perversion. Their blood shall be on them. So this would apply to both Tamar and Judah. And this is assuming that it's not a widow uh, or it's assuming that it extends to widowhood. Maybe it doesn't. But again, uh, I don't know if it completely applies, but if we mapped it on, Judah himself would be uh, worthy of death. But even if it isn't, even if this doesn't apply to him, let's say the widow, the widowhood aspect nullifies this application. Judah is committing harlotry. Uh, Judah is committing fornication. Uh, he is uh, uh, engaged in a, a shameful and sinful practice um, that, at least in the New Covenant, we know is deserving of, of death. So Judah is calling for the death of his daughter-in-law while he himself also deserves death. Um, again, this is a, a kind of possibly a flimsy typology, but if Judah is anticipating the, the kind of synagogue of Satan of the first century and uh, Tamar is anticipating the, the new bride of the first century, Judah is, he's the harlot. He's, he is uh, he, uh, a, holy, a holy people turned harlot, while Tamar is a unholy person turned, or, or a unholy person turned holy, or a, a harlot turned holy. Um, so there could be something like that going on there, where the, the first century Jews are persecuting the Christians, calling for their deaths when they are the innocent ones, and the, the first century non-believing Jews were the guilty ones. Uh, there could be something there. What, is, what does this remind you of? There is this kind of, uh, he calls her out, this man who he himself deserves to die, calls her out, he says, bring her out and let her be burned. What is this? What does this remind? Does this remind you of any other episode in Scripture? The crowd called for the stoning of the woman. Very good. Uh, yes, the uh, woman caught in adultery, or the pericopi adultery, the the woman caught in adultery in John eight. Um, it's very similar. It's a very similar moment. You have this woman. Uh, she really did uh, commit adultery. Similar, I mean, Tamar really did uh, commit a, a kind of sin. But uh, she's called out, and Jesus says, he who is without sin casts the first stone. And it says their consciences were bothering them. That they, were, they were struck in their conscience, and they laid down their stones, starting with the oldest, and they walked away. So uh, Jesus, he writes in the sand twice, and he speaks once. Uh, Tamar speaks twice, and it's these very brief kind of statements that cause the persecutors to repent or relent. Both Judah, he hears, oh, this is me. She's been more righteous than I. He drops his jug of gasoline. The people with the woman caught in adultery, they know that they've sinned. Perhaps Je there's different interpretations of this. Perhaps Jesus is specifically talking about adultery, and so the men are laying down their, their rocks. Perhaps he's talking about sin generally. That's a more conventional reading. Um, but either way, they themselves knew that they deserved the same thing that they were calling for this woman. So they laid their stones down. So... Tamar is kind of anticipating Jesus here in what she's doing. She gets Judah to drop his stone. Jesus gets the crowd to drop their stones. Tamar turns Judah from the error of his ways. Judah confesses and he repents. And this foreshadows Judah's confession and repentance later on with Joseph, 
We see Judah kind of leading the way and confessing for his brothers. Later on, he says, truly we are guilty because of our brother, for we saw his distress when he implored us and did not listen. So we see the older brother being redeemed through repentance. The older brother identifying his guilt, confessing it, and forsaking it, repenting of it. So we see that Judah here, he's not going to the same, extents as, uh, same extent as Cain or Ishmael or Esau, but he's starting to repent. The older brother's being redeemed. Um, this intervening grace of Tamar, like Christ, redeems the older brother. It elicits repentance. And since I've, I've connected this with the first century Jews, who might be a Judah in the first century? Which, who, who are a couple of Judas that we see? Older brothers, hypocritical Pharisees, literally Pharisees, who repent. Big one. Rock star of the New Testament. Augustine. Paul. Paul, exactly. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Paul was a Pharisee, and he repents. Um, Jesus intervenes, and he repents. Another one, lesser known one, um, I'll, I'll keep it for the end because uh, I think Jesus might have this next part in mind when he talks to this guy. All right, so the hope of redemption is rekindled with these two brothers being born, Zara and Perez. Zara possibly means rising and Perez means breach uh, uh, or breakthrough. Not breach in the sense of coming out legs first, but breach like breaking through a wall. And so once again, in this episode, we have the younger supplanting the older. It's just right there at the beginning. It's right there, the younger, and what does the younger anticipate? What does the younger mean in Genesis? Who? Who does the younger anticipate? What's the typology of the younger brother? Huh? I was gonna say Paul, but that's wrong. Jesus, the younger brother is Jesus. The first brother is like Adam. The older brother is like Adam. He's the first Adam, and the younger brother is like Jesus. He's the second Adam. That's what, that is what Perez represents. So the older, Zara, he comes through. He's born, and the midwife puts a red, thre uh, a red uh, a scarlet thread on his arm, on his hand. Okay? Adam comes through. The humanity comes through. The first Adam comes through, and he's killed. There's blood, okay? And he goes back, and then the younger brother breaks through. And then the first Adam follows the younger brother, and he's born again. <laughs> he's born again, right? He comes out a second time. Yeah. What does this remind you of? Who, who is Jesus talking to? He says, you're, you're a teacher of Israel, and you don't know that you have to be born again? Should I, who, yeah, Nicodemus, Nicodemus, Nicodemus is a Pharisee, and he comes to Jesus by night, because he's afraid of what people will think, right, and Jesus says this, you got to be born, you, you studied the Old Testament, and you don't know that you have to be born again, I don't know, I'm just guessing, but to me, it seems like, seems like Zara's born again, <laughs> it seems like there's something there. So Zara, his descendants, um, they, they start kind of bringing some more older brother behavior. Uh, anybody want to guess who, who descends from Zara? Prominent figure. I talk about a lot. Nope. Achan. Achan is, is from Zara. And Phineas, when he, he's talking, he's uh, talking to some of the tribes. He's afraid that they're starting to sin. Uh, Phineas, he, he says to them this. He says, did not Achan, the son of Zara, commit a trespass in the accursed thing? And wrath fell on the congregation of Israel. And that man did not perish alone in his iniquity. Again, Adam did not perish alone in his iniquity. We, in Adam, all sinned, right? Uh, Zara. Uh, the son of Zerah, Achan, what does Phineas say? And that man did not perish alone in his iniquity. Achan brings a lot of other people down with him. But in the restoration of Israel, in their return from captivity, 
We do have Zara. We do have, just as the older brother's being redeemed in Genesis, we start to see the older brother redeemed in the whole of Scripture. When they come back, we have a son of Zara, whose name is Pethahiah. He says he's of the children of Zara, the son of Judah. And he, like, he's in a, he is elevated to a similar position as Joseph. He says, in Nehemiah 11, he was the king's deputy in all matters concerning the people. Just like Joseph was second in command, this son of Zerah was second in command when the Jews returned from Babylon. And then the younger brother, Perez, okay, younger brother, the younger brother is typological of Christ. Mm -hmm. Who descends from Perez? Anybody know? I have three answers in mind. Nebuchadnezzar? Oh, no. Nope. Oh. All right. The first one is Boaz. Boaz marries Ruth. And then Boaz is the great grandfather of who? Jesus. King David. And then from King David comes Christ. Right. Okay. So Perez, the younger brother, this is the line. And in David specifically, we have we have strong younger brother and older brother motifs embodied in David. At, at times, there's things where the author is clearly saying he's being like Esau right now. And then there's other times where he's clearly saying he's like Jacob right now. Um, and so there's, there is this younger brother, younger, uh, older brother, younger brother motif in David, just as it is in Christ. Christ. That's exactly what all of this culminates in. Jesus puts on the garments of the older brother. Jesus breaks through uh, uh, the older brother. All of these things culminate in Jesus being both the older brother and the younger brother, redeeming uh, the older brother, humanity, us from uh, sin and death. Also, uh, the elders at the end of Ruth, they give this kind of benediction to Ruth and Boaz. They say, uh, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. And so uh, from, from that comes Jesus. All right, let's pray. The charge is this. Walk with integrity. Confess your sins. Do not be like Pharisaical Judah. Instead, be like confessing and repentant Judah. Find a confessor if you don't have one. Find someone who you can trust and disciple you and is not struggling with the same sins as you and that you can be honest with and confess your sins to them. Confess your sins, more importantly, to God. Be honest with them. Uh, don't try to pretend to be like someone you're not. Um, and pursue holiness. Confess them, repent them, repent of them, and pursue holiness. And go and sin no more, as Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery. And then when making right judgments, as Jesus calls us to do, consider your own sin. Make sure you're not walking in sin like Judah, that you're not burning with lust for harlots while you're calling for the burning of harlots. Uh, make sure that you remove the log from your own eye before you remove the speck of dust uh, from your brother's eye. May God give you the dew of heaven, the fatness of the earth, the abundance of grain and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.